places where thousands of years ago, the roof of this cave collapsed in over the river, and this water table is forced a lot closer to the surface, creating these nice windows where we're able to access that groundwater from where we can see this mineral rich water out on the surface. Now, all the minerals flowing through our groundwater here in Kentucky are what give this blue hole its color. Millions of little microscopic crystals, uh, mostly a mineral called calcite, yeah. float on the surface and start to bounce water in millions of different directions. Eventually, that causes this whole blue hole to turn above the color to the sky up above it. Here in a couple hours, when the sun's hitting it directly, that'll usually end up about the color of my shirt. But right now, since it's still a little shady over here, it's reflecting those trees up above it a lot better. You end up with that sort of turquoise green color. But y'all have any questions about our blue hole before we move a little further along? Right here, not very deep at all. Uh, it's only about 16 feet. If you were to ask the same question about 100 years ago, uh, they would tell you it was a bottomless man-eating pit. Uh, during the Civil War yeah, in the mid-1860s, uh, this was actually a Confederate supply depot. They set up a camp here around the valley, uh, stationed around 4,000 troops at Lost River. They used our cave entrance as a supply depot. Those soldiers constantly told stories about different things disappearing in here. Things like uh, wagons, crates of supplies, people, deer, anything that was unlucky enough to swim out to the center of this pool or slide into the center would be sucked under and disappear. What they didn't realize though is instead of sinking down to the bottom, this river moves at around 90 gallons per second. And during a storm, water pressure builds up in these blue holes and speeds can reach up to 40 miles an hour. So anything that fell in, rather than being sucked down, just sort of be hauled sideways. So, bottomless man-eating pit, really is about as deep as the deep end of a swimming pool. Yeah. What kind of animals do you live in? Live in here? We have loads of wildlife that lives around our blue holes. Uh, mostly, in the water, we'll have uh, crawdads or crayfish, depending on where you're from, uh, bluegills, and smallmouth bass. They all love these sunny spots around the blue holes. If you go further up the trail there, you'll see blue hole number three. That's the best place to see all those fish. It's a really sunny little pit, uh, and they really love to gather right near the surface. Mommy. Any other questions? <coughs> well, if y'all do think of any, feel absolutely free to ask as we make our way along here. But for now, we're all going to really run along this up. bank towards Stand the up. Wipe them up. Let's go.
Now, have you all been to any other caves before? Have you all been to Mammoth or Gathic Caverns? Probably heard a lot of stories about how their various entrances were discovered. I uh, think Mammoth Caves thing tool right now is still a walking tour. Their entrance is created by a farmer who dug for 10 years and probably found a tunnel. Uh, if there were caves, there's a horse going into their entrance from some of the early settlers. They discovered it that way. We don't really have a good story about how our cave was discovered. It's a pretty big hole in the ground. We're in the middle of nowhere. It kind of stands out. Most people have been in Bowling Green, people have used our cave. Thousands of years ago, our cave Native Americans set up these little hideouts in some of the upper piles of the to our cave. Places that stayed away from the water were nice and warm and dry all year round. We found things they left behind, like spears, axes, and charcoal fire pits that piled up buried in these huge amounts of clay. Eventually, though, those Native Americans moved along. And then around 1780, some of the first European settlers came into the area. They started setting up these big farms all around the rim of the valley. Those farmers had a really creative idea for what to use our cave for. They built a little stone dam across the entrance and set up a small wooden flower mill. I would have wooden mill existed up. And it worked really well. See, for the most part, creeks and streams around Kentucky will start to dry up during the summer. But our creek never will. We have an 80 mile drainage basin. So any rainfall, every pond, lake, and creek in the area eventually feeds into this waterway and we'll never have a drought. But unfortunately for those early millers, we do flood. A lot. In February of this year, water was well over our house right here where we're standing at now. It's up to about that second ridge of rock over there. You can sort of use that for reference. During Hurricane Harvey, we the metal roof of that building beside us. The of 2010 brought water 16 feet past our cave ceiling. Probably just about a quarter history. So I think you can sort of imagine just what might have happened to a small, flimsy wooden flower mill built right in the path of that river. After that first mill got washed away with one of those big floods, a man named William Perkins came along in 1900. In this place in the soil that we've got now, a deep block. He set up a big gate, sort of leading the first door into that entrance behind it. He set up uh, cabins and campgrounds out there on the ridge. Built an electric generator right here inside the entrance so he could power all that stuff. In 1930, he built the Lost River Cave nightclub right there across the river. And that nightclub was a huge success. In a very short span of time, this became the most popular music radio in Kentucky. Hundreds of people would flock down here. What the people like Donna Shore, the Orchestra, Ella Fitzgerald, and Sir Francis Crick. These are ridiculously famous celebrities for their time. But they'll go literally with hole in the ground in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky. Eventually, though, that success went away. Throughout the 60s, rock and roll became more popular. Jazz music slowly went out of style. Mr. Perkins slowly started losing business. In 1967, he was broke. He was forced to sell off the property and abandon it. That's what it begins the dark age of Broadcase history. Between 1967 and 1983, 55 tons of trash thrown into our cave. This was the largest illegal dumping site in Central Kentucky. We're having trouble imagining that much garbage. That's about the same way as 14 fully grown elephants spending end to end made of nothing but trash. Tires, oil, hogs, washing machines, bathtubs. All of this junk was thrown off the ridge above you and slowly forced into the cave of those lines. That brings us to what we're out here today. Friends of Lost River, the organization I work for is a nonprofit that was founded in the 80s to protect and preserve this park. Hundreds of volunteers made that possible. We worked for 10 years cleaning up all that trash. Slowly restored this cave to what we've got now. Today we've got a little over 72 acres of forests, wetlands, and a really cool cave. We will enjoy all things to all being. We are a nonprofit. So every dollar you spend in the gift shop today, every dollar y'all spend on your tickets, stays here in the park, gives to conservation efforts and education projects around the city and around the state of Kentucky. So thank you all so much for joining us. We're all of us here at Washington Cave. Y'all literally keep the lights on.
I'm not going to be there towards the end, but you don't have any questions. A little bit. That is so cool. It took a thousand turtles to make this rock here. <laughs> Just kidding. Ducked a little lower. <laughs> and we made it. All right, now, ladies and gentlemen, you should be able to raise up. Uh, well, wait for your neighbor to do so. Yeah. <laughs> Let them do it first. I don't want to be the one that tips All right, everybody. Well, welcome to Lost River Cave, the inside edition. You can turn your lights on, Doug, and have your helmet. Oh, mine is on. Yeah, it's on. Mm-hmm. I was talking to Doug, Doug. Daddy has yours, buddy. It is like a pink Daddy boy has show it. in here with all those lights. That is crazy. Now, okay. <laughs> now, the first thing we love to show off is what we call a flow stone. We call it a flow stone because there's water flowing over stone. Fascinating, I know. Thank you. Now, who here has ever been to a movie theater before? Me. All right, have you ever got your feet stuck to the floor of the movie theater? Yes. Yeah. All right, and have you ever had a soda pop? Yes. And if you drink too many sodas, what happens to your teeth? They rot away and you get cavities. Well, welcome to a cave of tea, everybody. <laughs> there you go, parents. There's your one PSA for the day. Now, this 
water that you see trickling down is actually carbonic acid, the same stuff that you see within your soda water. And if you hold open a soda open for too long, what's going to happen? It goes flat like all these jokes. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. <laughs> but as this water's trickling down in the movie theater, it actually goes flat and leaves behind sugar. In the cave, it leaves behind minerals. So this glowstone is consistently growing even right now before your eyes. And as this water trickles down, it continues to leave those deposits and grow. This brown peanut butter looking color is what we call travertine. It's commonly seen on HGTV for bathroom tiles. See, we're making connections for all people here. Now, if you notice, we also have this black rock right here. This is what we call a historical pollution scar. You see, in the 1930s, there was a cow pasture above your heads, and what do cows do to feel besides eat grass? They go poo. They also go poo. This is what we call a pollution scar, everybody. The jokes get way worse from here, so please, for, for my sanity, start laughing, okay? I need it. So here's the deal. Our entire flowstone used to be that black color. It was stained with that cow manure and nitrates and all those oils. But the flowstone is now brown and healthy because it's been healing. Because we've been protecting things up above like sinkholes and streams that filter down to here. So when you start to do the right thing, even a little bit over time, it continues to build and it shows. So here we are. Oh, helmet down. Now, right over here, you can see this is what we call wildcat rock. There's his eyes, his nose, his ears, and his mouth. See? Oh, wow. Or a hot dog rock. There's a hot dog and there's buns. Or dragon rock. Or mother-in-law rock. Whatever, you know. Okay. Now we're drifting into what we call the breakdown room. This is the largest in the cave. In fact, we've been a two-story building in here so big. It's pretty nice. Now, who here has ever had a bath before? <laughs> Not a really resounding yes from the back of the boat, but that's okay. So if you pull the cork out of the bathtub, you will see this water vortex. And as our flooding continues to wash up here into the ceiling, we have a vortex as it drains. That's why you see the cave walls have been slowly eroding away, just like a big funnel underneath. <laughs> Falls in the river, it's gone. Same. We have an uncover for you. Oh, that is cool. <coughs> no. Can't and we're up. probably going to hit a rock. You're going to feel it there on the left side. You're going to jump, and I'm going to laugh because of my dark sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> feel a nice cold wet drip of water on your heads as we came through there. Yeah. Alright, that is what we call a cave kiss. If you feel a warm one, it's a bat kiss. <laughs> now, sir, what's your name? Mark. Mark, how many cheese pizzas can you eat in one night? Mommy, mommy, twelve. Twelve. <laughs> we'll, we'll go with two. Two. Okay, <laughs> sir, how many cheese pizzas can you eat one night at the end of the boat? Uh, it has to have pepperoni. It has to have pepperoni. It's got pepperoni on it. Too large. I can beat you, man. All right, we're going to have a pizza contest. <laughs> Our bats can eat a thousand mosquitoes in one night. That is equivalent to us eating 20 cheese pizzas or pepperoni all in one night. Wow. So, you know how important bats are for our area? Who here likes mosquitoes? Not me. Nobody. Not so, bats are super important. Whenever you hear bats, you typically think of caves. However, you should also think of trees. Our bats roost in those large 200-year-old trees that you all saw as you were coming down here uh, through the valley. And during the winter time, they'll hide out here too. But the bats that come in here during the winter are typically adolescent males and they don't know any better and they're looking in the wrong spot. Spot. I about said spark. That's right. <laughs> As in, Mark knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Speaking my language. I'm going to take his microphone away from him. It's too loud. It sounds like the puppets back there. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for me? No. Okay. So if you are a stalactite enthusiast, you're at the wrong cave. Now, if you continue to look up, you're going to see all these little points growing down. And these are our stalactites. They are, it takes about 100 years for one cubic inch. And these form just like a leak does inside your house. You have water and gravity working against you. 
Okay. You'll have to come back later. But we do have one rather large slide out of our tour. And it's what we call the praying hands or the stunt diver. Ah. Ah, 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 ah. I'm trying to hold on to you. We know it's not that big, folks. We hear that all the time, but we still think it's impressive. <laughs> some of you got that joke. Some of you just did. And some of you are going to leave that review on TripAdvisor. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fired me yet. Right. <laughs> I've been trying. Right. So please, I'm just kidding. Please don't help me. <laughs> now, right now we have a whole city up above our heads. You know, Lost River Cave used to not have this, and of course, we used to not have as much built in our drainage basin in this area. Soil is like nature's sponge. You need soil to be nice and airy. It needs to be about 50% pore space and 50% matter for it to infiltrate naturally. In the year 2000, we expanded National Road up above your heads by two lanes, and when we did that, we compacted the soil. We reduced that floor space, and that's what we call stormwater runoff now. After major rain events, this flowstone you see behind me would have been an underground waterfall. However, but because we expanded that road and compacted that soil, it no longer flows. So whatever we do up above here in this area, we need to remember it's going to affect these wonderful habitats we have underneath the town. This is our Grand Canyon, so we need to protect it. But we still like to have a little bit of fun here. So if you have some imagination, you may like this. Here's our Lost River Cave mummy. There's his head, his arms, and his legs. See? Yeah. <laughs> this is what we call the bonsai tree. This one's easier to see without the lights. Bonsai tree. Oh, wow. Hot air balloons are jellyfish. Yeah. yeah, maybe a little bit. And then because we're in Kentucky, sheep do tend to run away from us. Here, sheets or tree. So this would be 10 sheep standing cheek to cheek, running the other direction. <laughs> Again, that joke is for the parents. <laughs> now, does everybody hear the rushing water back there? Yes. Oh, and, waterfall. <laughs> yes. I'm trying to see how your flight or fight response is, sir. Yeah. Now, when we go back here, we're going to spin the boat around so you can see past the dam that we have. Of course, it's not a waterfall, it's just a three foot drop or so. We're actually going to be putting in one of these boards, so don't be too alarmed when we go on back there, okay? It's going to help us raise the water level up just a bit to keep the motors on the rocks. But it's obviously pretty loud as we go on back there, so if you have any damn questions, just wait till we come back outside where we can hear each other a little bit better, okay? Now, yeah, does anybody have any questions for me before we move on? I don't know what that was either, but it was back there. Did he have a young question? No? Okay. Now, if you did not like my tour, you can get off now and take the emergency exit, which is right over here. <laughs> this leads around to the front of the cave system. And then you have to go, and it's what we call a wet passageway. We're going to see crawfish in there. We're also going to see salamanders and other cool little cave creatures, too. That no, all went back kid. there and then wait for it to no. flood so they can get more food. No. 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 Like stay on the boat. And sticks and dead Lily, stay on the boat. There, and it's still allowed to be Oh, I'm talking to a little one. I like it. <laughs> right now we're just waiting for Gavin to come on back here. But uh, it's a really beautiful spot. If you take a look around, this is actually one of the more beautiful the cave. This is our dark zone of the cave system. This is where our cave creatures live. They are used to the consistent temperature of 55 to 43 degree year-round water. And they are very slow. There's the other boat. This is what we call the art of killing time. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, boy. You're going to do his job for him? You're so nice. She has to stop talking. Yay! Yay! She has to stop talking. <laughs> Again! Again!
We have all sorts of holes in this cave, not just in our stories, but in the early 1800s, Bowling Green used to advertise that we had a million year old sewer system, and guess where you are? You're in it. Welcome, everybody. Now, if you keep looking up, you will see some of our horned coral fossils. Horned coral is what makes up all the lives, something that you see all around you today. And it is this ancient sea line that allows us to have these caves or these cave formations that you see all around us. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, in nature never hurries. Atom by atom, she finishes her work. It's very true for this case and for what you see throughout our valley. If it wasn't for that ancient sea life, we wouldn't have those great big trees that you will see down there either. It's all because of limestone and how the earth's processes have been continuing on for millions of years. And if you look right up here, you see our world famous skin types. Get in market skin. You get it, Dad? I do get it. He's not your dad. Wow. He's your papa. You get it, Dad? It's not how that works. Now, do we have any questions after being back there? Hey, yes. Uh, what is that? That's a rock. <laughs> what is that specifically? These are stalactites. Remember that. A man playing sandcastle chess with a griffin. Yeah. Is that what I heard? Yeah, right there. What state are you from? This one. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Anyway, any other questions? Wait time, wait time. Good deal. Our game continues on that direction for another our next exit is what we call Big Bertha. It's about 2,000 feet away from the dam that we were at earlier. And that is where we imagine our Civil War soldiers would go through commonly. You know, the water level was naturally about a foot to two foot deep, so they would trudge through here, hit Big Bertha, and then come on back. Mark, if you were about 14 to 25 years old, you do the same thing, right? I would, yes. I would too. Who would? Now I, I just take I, a boat. I've done it. Yeah, now you take a boat, yeah. lazy sir. Now. <laughs> Uh, back in that direction, though, we do have cave fish that have adapted to the system. After living no. in here for thousands of no. years, they have lost the pigment to their skin. They are about the size of a minnow, and they are pink. No you can see their water, you can see their blood vessels working inside of them. You can see their no food digesting. Me. You can even see that their eyes are non-existent. They have eye sockets, but they fill them up with fat. It's the best no way for them to use their eye sockets. So they're eyeless cave fish, so we just call them <laughs> I let that joke get to the back. Now those soldiers used to come in here and they would sign their names with candlelight. 
and the ones I'm going to show you are slightly faded, but they are still there. At the center of my light, you'll see some black. Where? No. Yeah. Where'd it go? There it is. All right, right there. This black writing is actually caused by a candle, and it allowed that to stay there. This is what we call wholesome graffiti from the 1880s. <laughs> they would put in their names, their their regiments, sometimes the years that they were born or the years that they were here. And then it continues all up along this path. And if you see, there are some other black and little lines. You kind of had to know it's right there. They are right there. Now, March 18th in 1868, the James Gang robbed the Southern Deposit Bank in Russellville. When they robbed that bank, they got away with $60,000. They killed the bank manager, and one of them was shot in his right leg. And after all that commotion, they needed a place to hide. So then they came down here to Lost River, and they hid up along the top ridge. As that night went on, the young man that was shot started to get sick. Stop so it. Frank and Jesse James sneak into Bowling Green, and they went and kidnapped one of our doctors. <laughs> yes. They brought him down here and they gave him two options. They said either you take the bullet out or here, put the bullet in. And he gets right to work. Several hours later, he did to save that young man. And Frank and Jesse are so grateful they take the doctor to the mouth of the cave and let him go on one condition. Say, as long as you don't tell anybody what you've seen or anything that you've heard, we're going to let you live. And of course, he says, you've got it. So he gets to work. He saves the young man's life. And then Frank and Jesse take the doctor to the mouth of the cave and let him go on one condition. As long as you don't tell anybody what you've seen or anything that you've heard, we're going to let you live. And he says, you got it. And being the smart man that he was, he went and told his wife everything he saw and everything he heard while he was down here. She was wondering where he was all night long, so he told her this story and she believed him. Would you? No. Well, okay, that's a long ride home. But anyway, so we sat out there for three days. Half the town of Bowling Green was out there because we had no entertainment. So we all thought, oh, it'd be great to see Jesse James be captured. We thought there was one way in and one way out of this cave system, and that was that exit. We didn't even think about Big Bertha. So we sat there for three days, and on the third day, the sheriff's telegra sheriff sent a telegraph along from a neighboring sheriff in another county, and it said, Jesse James and his gang just robbed our bank. So there's your legend, everybody. <laughs> Mr. Perkins, who owned the underground nightclub that have told you that story much better than I ever could, mainly because we're pretty sure he made the entire thing up to get you into this cave system. <laughs> he was also a traveling salesman, so you know he was an honest guy. You could also go see the man that turned into leather, which only happens unless you're from Florida. He also had the man that turned into stone, which is a, no, that was a mannequin they carved out of concrete, so there you go. But all jokes aside, thank you so much for coming out here. Well, all we do is just strive to give everybody great experiences in nature because we feel like if you have a good experience in nature, you'll want to care for it later on. So thank you so much for coming out here today. Please go ahead and look forward. Look away from the lights. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Lean forward. Bye. 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 Bye.